Hello, everyone, fellow members of God's house, the family of God, the house of God. After the feast this year, I hope to give a detailed sermon on or teaching on living by faith. I'd like this message today to kind of be a run-up, a, a um, preview of that topic, an introduction to it, because we, the people of God, are supposed to be people who live, live by faith. As Romans 1.17 says, the just shall live by faith. Quoting from Habakkuk 2 verse 4, are you and I, Persons of deep faith in God, by faith I mean belief, I mean trust, I mean placing our confidence in God and his will in our lives. Um, that's what I'm talking about when I say faith. Uh, it, it, it means belief and trusting, being uh, at peace in your mind, without doubting and without any worry. And that God is walking out his plan, working his plan, his will for you and me, trusting God uh, is a huge part of real faith. Or do we have too many moments, let's be honest now with ourselves, that's the point of this sermon, to evaluate your own self, be ready for that sermon coming up in a month or two. Um, because I really think we need to understand that we have too many moments of unbelief. If we believe without doubting, Jesus, Yeshua himself said, all things are possible. Now, sometimes I'll say Jesus, and not necessarily always Jesus Christ. There are literally hundreds of places where the word just Jesus is there. And sometimes I'll say Yeshua, which was the Hebrew name his mama called him. Many of you uh, prefer the name Yeshua. Uh, that was his Hebrew name. Many of you prefer the name Jesus and may not even be familiar with the name Yeshua. So I'm going to introduce you to both names. And from time to time, I'll say Jesus. From time to time, I'll say Yeshua. It's the same person, our Savior, the Son of God, okay? Mark 9, 23. If you can believe, this is quoting Jesus. If you can believe all things, everything, all things are possible to him who believes. But when I look around the church, the group of believers in Christ and our Father, do I see, do you see a lot of miracles? Do we experience and glorify God for a lot of profound, instant healings? No, we don't. No, we don't. I don't anyway. Is that a problem God has now that he can't heal, that he's gone into retirement? No, of course not. Or is it a matter of weak faith, either by the pastor who's praying for healing or miracles, or by the one who hopes to be healed, or both? All I know is that for the last few decades, we really have not seen much in the way of profound, dramatic, instant healings. And I don't mean praying that the surgery goes well. I don't mean that the pain has improved, uh, but the person's still in a lot of pain. I don't mean that. I mean... Total, complete, instant, dramatic healings like we read about Christ and the apostles. Yeshua's word is so clear. If you can believe, everything is possible to anyone who believes. Mark 9, 23. We need this message because we're supposed to be living by faith. And I think God wants to do far more in our lives, far more healings, far more miracles. But is limited by your and my unbelief that we have still too much of. To me, the evidence is clear. We're not in a period of time of great faith. In fact, Jesus even wondered aloud, will the Son of Man find faith when he comes? Luke 18, 8. So we end time folks may need a booster on faith, including me. In fact, I started this sermon, this teaching, this study, because I was feeling I needed it for myself. That's the way most of my sermons start, as a Bible study for me. So welcome, everyone, to The Light on the Rock. Some of you tell others about our website. We really appreciate you who do that. Please register, as that allows you to leave comments, and it raises our profile considerably, allowing us to reach more people, for them to see our 
and, and, and to see our messages pop up, even without advertising, when a lot of people have registered. And it helps you especially, it helps especially raise our profile if you leave comments on the blogs. On the blogs, be aware that you can hover over the scripture and the whole verse pops up, but that works only in the blogs. Back to the message. Our Savior was known for his many miracles, walking on water, calming the stormy seas with just a word, multiplying food like the bread and the fish, resurrecting the dead back to life, and healing everyone who came to him. Matthew 12, 15, Luke 6, verse 19 says, He healed them all, all who came to him. <clears throat> but there was a time when even the Son of God on earth either couldn't or decided he wouldn't heal, except for a very few. The words in the scripture say he couldn't. And you say, that, that can't be possible. God can do anything he wants. Christ could do anything he wants. Well, we'll read it soon here. And as we get into this, I want you to ask yourself, if you'd been in that place where he couldn't heal anyone except a few, how would you have reacted? Would you, in fact, have been one of the very few who did receive healing from him, even if the others weren't being healed? A time when Jesus himself could not or would not heal? Let's read it in Mark 6. At the end of Mark 5, we read how Jesus resurrected a little girl, uh, Jairus' daughter, uh, who had died. And he also had healed a woman with the issue of blood while he was going there, who touched his garment, possibly his tzitzit or his tassels. And from there he went, and I do believe, of course, he wore those. The Old Covenant required you to wear the blue tassels and so on. And from there he went back home to Nazareth, his hometown. Do you recall, though, reading a lot about dramatic miracles in Nazareth? You won't, because they didn't believe. We'll read it here. I'll come back to Mark 5, sort of setting the stage for what we're going to read in Mark 6. My point, though, is a lot of dramatic healings were going on just before he went to Nazareth, and they heard about it. But So he ends up in Nazareth. Powerful miracles have been going on. Mark 6, verses 1 to 6. <clears throat> and then he went out from there and came to his own country, meaning his own area, and his disciples followed him. When Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What wisdom is this which has given him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary? Now, Joseph isn't mentioned here. He probably had died by now. The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Jude and Simon, Judas or Jude, same thing are not his sisters here with us. So they were offended at him. They're saying, come on, we know who this local yokel is. We grew up with him. We know his family. We know his brothers. And of course, keep in mind, Mary had at least six more children after birthing Jesus. Four sons and at least two daughters. Anyway, so so they were offended. He, he, I don't know what, what he's doing. They didn't trust him or whatever. And when Jesus then said to them, a prophet, maybe they were saying, he can't be a prophet. He can't be. He's a carpenter. But Jesus said, a prophet's not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. So even, even his own brothers and sisters weren't accepting him as who he was. Not yet. They did later. James and Jude became apostles later. And now he could do no mighty work there. Verse 5, Mark 6, verse 5. He could do no mighty work there. He could do no mighty work there. Let that sink in when Son of God himself was stymied. Except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He marveled because of their unbelief because of their lack of faith, because of their lack of trust, because of their doubting. He marveled because of their unbelief. And then he went about the village in a circuit teaching. The equivalent account in Matthew 13, verses 55 to 58, verse 58 says, Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now he marveled in Mark 6 because of their unbelief. 
Matthew 13 says he couldn't do the mighty works and miracles due to their lack of faith. Did you get that? Even Yeshua, the Son of God, could not heal many in his own hometown because they didn't trust and believe. I don't want that happening to you and me. It may be happening to you and me. It's the point of this sermon. I want you to be thinking about your own faith level or unbelief level. Because if we had total faith in Christ, in God, he did tell us in Mark 9, 23, that everything is possible. Everything to one who believes. And he also tells us in John, I think it's John 12, I didn't have this in my notes originally, but where he says that greater things than what you see me doing, you will do if you believe. Greater things than what Jesus himself was doing. So please get that. That's the point of the sermon is to get us to evaluate us. So when I give the next sermon, you've done that. Not the next sermon coming up, but the one in November or so. When was the last powerful miracle or dramatic healing you've ever experienced? It's probably been a while. Could it be because you or I have some unbelief going on? Their unbelief limited the power of God. Israel did the same thing. Uh, Psalm 78, verse 41 Verse 40, they provoked him in the wilderness, Psalm 78, grieved him in the desert, Psalm 78, verse 41, again they and again, over and over they tested God, limited the Holy One of Israel. So part of limiting God is when we aren't walking in obedience to him, with him, when we're allowing sins and, and, and not trusting God. Or, or not obeying God, that also will limit. You know, God will give grace to the humble and he will bless those who obey him. If we're living in some kind of sin right now and wondering why we're not getting great healings and miracles, I'm telling you why. We can't be living in sin and living ongoing. We all stumble. That's not what I'm talking about. But when we let something that we know is wrong, just go on and on and on in our lives. That's going to limit God in what he will do in your life. I submit to you that because of you or my unbelief at times, we also have had limited power. We've limited the power of Almighty God. So that's one of the big lessons of this, is that I really want to see God's power released. I want to see his power just boom out among his people. No more limiting. I want his power released. I want us seeing the equivalence of red seas opening up and food being multiplied, walking on water, resurrecting the dead. No more searching in our body if the pain is still there while we're being prayed for. That's not faith. That's doubting. Do you and I worry? Of course, most of us do from time to time, but worry is a demonstration of unbelief. Christ commands us not to worry in Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. Write that down and study it after this sermon. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about clothing. Don't worry about attire. Don't worry about your needs. Father knows them, and he will take care of you if you don't worry. We're commanded not to worry. Worrying shows we don't trust God. To really heal or take care of us. Too many of you and I worry too much of the time. You find yourself saying, I'm worried that, and that should be a wake-up call to you. <clears throat> we're not hearing of, we're not seeing many healings among believers. I don't mean saying things like the surgery went well, God, God heard our prayers. I mean total, rapid, instant healings, like we read of Yeshua and Jesus in the book of Acts. When Jesus sent out the disciples into the ministry field, he gave them power to cast out demons and to heal, to cure the sick. He sent them to heal the sick. I want you to notice he didn't send them out to pray for the sick, which is what we do today. He sent them out to heal the sick. Do you see the difference? Do you hear the difference? 
Luke 9, verse 1 and 2. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure the diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick, not just pray for them, to heal the sick. Verse 6 says, They departed went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. That was Luke 9, verses 1 to 6, especially 1 and 2 and 6. Luke 9. Do you hear the difference between praying for and actually healing? <clears throat> and these were disciples who didn't, didn't even have the Holy Spirit yet. No Holy Spirit had been given yet. So all this has changed for our time now. I don't buy it. I think it's us. I long to see that in the ministries today. Lots of real healings, not fake ones. God has used me for a few of those, but not the majority of times I pray, to be honest with you. The majority of times I don't see a dramatic healing. But just some here and there. And some were very powerful and instant and definite healings. Remember what Jesus said, Mark 9, 23. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Everything is possible if you believe. But the problem is, none of us likes to confess that our faith is weak. But I submit to you that our evidence shows that our faith is weak as a group, as, as individuals. Be sure you hear my follow-up sermon in October, November. Jesus often spoke of faithless or you of little faith or other similar descriptions. What would he say about you and me today or our fellowship? the people we fellowship with, the group, what would he say? Oh, you of little faith, or you of wonderful, powerful faith? <clears throat> so could a lot of the problem be that we just don't have real, unquestioning faith anymore? We worry, we doubt, we wonder. Rather than just thanking God even in and even for the troubles God knows we're in. You know, Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, in all things, give thanks. In all things, give thanks. And the peace of God that goes beyond understanding will come upon you. Paul said that once he came to realize this, understand this, even his thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, it might have been an eye problem or something, it made him glory in his tribulations and take pleasure in his infirmities. Now that's not lack of faith. That's great faith. That's great trust. It's great belief that God's got this. God's got this situation. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. I actually have a whole sermon or two on this. Thanking God in and for all things, I think is the title of it. Recommend you hear it if you haven't. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 10. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, most remember that, that when you're going through hard times, it's to, it's to strengthen God's presence, strengthen God's strength in you, but we have to have the right attitude towards it. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He says, if I'm not boasting in my infirmities, I may not have the power of Christ resting on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Wow. In reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We're not doing that. These people I know about aren't doing that. If we're honest during the anointing and we still feel the pain during the prayer, do we also feel doubt? Christ asks if he would find faith on the earth when he returns. 
Let's turn now to Mark 9, verse 17 to 29. Mark 9, the, the story is this man comes to Yeshua, says, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, and the spirit seizes him, throws him down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes at his teeth, becomes rigid, like seizure, like paralyzed. I spoke to your disciples, but they couldn't do anything. They couldn't cast it out. He, Yeshua, answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw them, immediately the spirit, the demon, convulsed him, fell to the ground. He wallowed, foaming at the mouth. Yeshua asked his father, How long has he been like this? He said, From childhood. He's often being thrown into the fire, into the water, to destroy him. But if you, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. Help us. What a prayer. What a, what a comment. Jesus said to him, if, this is that verse I keep quoting, if you can believe, if you can have faith, if you can trust. Other meanings of believe, right? All things are possible to him who believes. That verse is still in my Bible. I'm not going to excuse it away. If you believe, all things are possible to you. I absolutely trust Yeshua means what he said here. For all generations, for all time. We know also so many times Jesus said things like, According to your faith, be it unto you. Be healed. Sometimes he even asked people if they believed. And if they said yes, then he healed them. Immediately, verse 24, Mark 9, 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. One of the most honest scriptures in the Bible. We all claim to have faith, at least some faith, but can we admit like this man did, that we individually and we as a group, our faith is small, is lacking, and wavers. Please, Lord, help our unbelief. The evidence that we see so few healings and dramatic miracles is proof. So anyway, he commands the Jesus commands this dumb spirit, deaf and dumb spirit, to come out. He throws him to the ground as if he's dead. Jesus lifts him up by the hand. And then the disciples came later on and asked him, verse 28, how come we couldn't cast it out? In verse 29, so he said to them, this kind comes out only. This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Maybe that's a big part of it. Prayer and fasting. We need to be praying and fasting for this kind of prayer, uh, this kind of faith. Because if we do, if we believe in Christ, he says in John, I think it's 12, that even greater works than these you'll be able to do. The truth is, most of the people getting anointed and prayed for healing today don't get healed immediately and rapidly as we read in Scripture. Ministers everywhere justify it. Oh, they say because signs and wonders made people take notice and they needed that in the first century church to get the church started. I don't buy that. Most of the ones we pray for remain in pain, remain sick, remain, including many of my own anointings. So I'm preaching to myself. It's a lesson for me. What's happening? What's going on? And yet I've also had some really powerful, instant, dramatic, total healings. I've had that too. But not very many. So what's wrong? What's going on? I've been healed of cancer twice in my life. <clears throat> the first time I was told I might have only three more months to live. And I didn't even tell my wife at first. Yet I have other issues I haven't been healed of. And I prayed for people. And by the way, that first time healing of cancer, 
It's very dramatic. And I'll tell you the story in the, in the coming sermon of what the doctor said. I prayed for people who were dramatically healed instantly, but the majority of the times the healings didn't take place. I prayed for sick people, like a man who'd had a stroke recently, had a hard time speaking properly, or following, you know, his cognitive impact was terrible. Couldn't remember what he was going to say over and over again. His wife had terrible back pain, sciatica, and two or three other kind of back pains. We prayed for them and others at the feast in Colorado that year, about nine or ten years ago. The man who had a major stroke upon the amen was able to run up and down the stairs in the rented hall. His voice was clear and solid. His memory was solid. His wife, who had that severe back pain, could barely bend over, was now showing us how she could bend over and touch her toes. And the pain, all of it, was gone. But others I prayed for were not healed. And I don't know why. I don't know if it was my lack of faith during the prayer, or was it them, or was there some other reason? So I've witnessed both. There are many, many more I can tell you about, but not nearly enough. Most of the time, most of us ministers, including me, are not seeing healings in the majority of our healing prayers. I'm sure God wants to turn that around. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, by belief, by trust, not by sight. Are you and I living by faith, walking by faith? Are you sure you are? We're told that when we're sick to call for an elder for anointing and prayer for healing. How many of us even bother asking for an elder to anoint us for healing anymore, like James 5.14 says, or to send an anointed cloth anymore, or at least to pray over the situation over the phone if they live far away? Remember the centurion who said, you don't need to come to my house, just give the word and it will be done. That still applies today. God's the one. Christ is the one who does the healing. It's not me. It's not the minister. So we can pray over the phone. A lady from Texas, and I'm in Florida, asked me for praying for her situation. <clears throat> That's fine. But how many of us bother making that phone call anymore? Because we see so few, I think it, it's not happening very often. James 5, 14 to 16 is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray for over him. You can call your friends too, but God's emphasis here is the elders, the anointed ministers. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he's committed sins he'll be forgiven sometimes we become sick because of sins the sins make us worry the sins make us stressed out the sins might even bring on the problems maybe we got drunk and have a car accident or we're loose sexually and have an STD sexually transmitted disease Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. That's part of the healing is that we need to be praying for one another. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That's part of the problem, to be honest with you. I think too many of us aren't seeking the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of the kingdom of God enough the effective fervent prayer and fervent doesn't mean you have to shout it doesn't mean being loud one of the most fervent prayers is the in the bible is hannah and uh, i think it's first samuel 2 where just her mouth was moving and eli thought she was drunk she wasn't she was giving a, a fervent prayer for a son and god heard that prayer the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I'm going to shift gears here for a second. On a related issue, let me switch gears. 
Would you and I have been asked to leave the room when Yeshua came into our house to heal someone or to resurrect someone? He often healed in front of a group of people, I'm sure. In fact, he even one time said, who bumped me? Who touched me? The disciples said, how can you say who touched you? Everyone's touching you. Everyone's bumping into you. So there are a lot of people around when the woman who had the issue of blood was healed, for example. But sometimes if there was doubting, there was ridicule going on, sometimes he put everyone out, except a handful. So here, uh, the ruler of the synagogue, the head man there, had asked Yeshua to come and heal his daughter. On the way there, they were told the girl had died. Matthew says that she already was dead when the ruler asked for it. Either way, by the time Christ got there, he was dead. She was dead. Mark 5, let's pick up the story in verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, that she had died, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid. Don't let that bother you. These are all elements of faith. Don't let that news bother you. Don't let whatever news bother you. Only believe. Even news that you're going to die or someone has died. Only believe. Those verses still apply to me and you. He permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. John, the brother of James, I meant. Came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, saw a tumult, and those who were wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why, why make all this commotion and weep? The child's only sleeping. She's not dead. So they ridiculed him. But when he put them all out, Outside, he took the father and the, ma and the mom of the child and those who were with him, Peter, James, and John, and entered where the child was lying. And she was dead. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked. She was 12 years old. And they were overcome with amazement. So everyone except Peter, James, and John and the parents were put out. Our belief must be strong. But even Yeshua, Jesus, put people out of the room to get rid of any unbelief that could possibly be there. He didn't want those negative vibes in the room while he was trying to resurrect the dead. <clears throat> even Peter later did the same thing when he resurrected Dorcas in Acts 9, Devout woman, Acts 9, verses 39 to 41. Acts 9, 39 to 41. Peter put everyone out of the room, and then he prayed, and she came back to life. Our belief must go beyond just believing there is a God. Our belief has to be that he has our well-being in mind, that he wants us healed that he wants us to experience wonderful things. But it can't be just in believing in God. After all, James 2.19, James 2.19 says, even demons believe and fear God. In this sermon, I just want us all to ponder how unbelief has kept even the Son of God from doing healings and miracles in Nazareth. I want us to ponder our own faith, our own closeness to God, our own righteousness, God's righteousness in us, our own obedience, our own fervency, our own lack of worry. Start being aware of when you're worrying, when you're feeling troubled. That's not faith. That's not belief. Next time I'll get into the details about how we strengthen our faith, defining faith. I've done some of it here. I'm working on it too. The sermon was for me. Having powerful faith is a part of the fruit of the Spirit, is a gift of the Spirit. The gift of God through His Spirit. We'll explore that next time. If you want to study that ahead of time, you can read that in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 10, especially verse 9. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 10. <clears throat> How It's a gift of God. 
to have this profound, strong faith. Ask God for it. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 and 2 says, Though you have so much faith that you can move mountains, but if you don't have love, you're nothing. You're nobody. And then he ends 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13 by saying there's three big ones, three big gifts. We all would like to have the gift of healing, the gift of prophecy, you know, the, the wonderful, exciting gifts. But the ones that Paul mentions are faith, hope, and love. Faith. One of the big three gifts of God. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Your King James will say charity. So use this time till the next faith sermon coming up in a couple months. Study on faith on your own. Ask God to give you faith without doubting. Check yourself anytime you have unbelief going on, worry going on, wondering going on, doubting going on. Because as we've seen in the presence of unbelief, even Jesus or Yeshua would not, could not heal in his own hometown. That's how limiting it is when we don't fully believe. So be aware of that. Be ready for that next sermon. We'll go into it big time. We also probably have to repent of any unbelief. As the man of the Son, when Jesus asked him, asked him if he believed, he says, yes, I believe. Oh, help my unbelief. I thought that was wonderful. So let's pray and ask Christ for more faith. Ask him to help our unbelief. Help, help us to walk by faith more. I think if we do, we're going to be likely seeing a lot more and experiencing many more miracles, many more healings to God's glory. I'll end this in prayer. Holy God Almighty, God Most High, and Holy Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, our King, our brother, we come to you Knock out this unbelief in our lives, Father. If you ask us, do you believe, I want us to be able to honestly say yes without any doubt, without any reservation, without any wondering and worrying. Yes, we believe. I pray, O oh God in heaven, our Father, that you will start to heal more, do more wonderful, powerful miracles among your family as we respond to this topic. Help us to seek you in your righteousness, first thing. Help us repent of areas of our lives that are lax, lazy, and sinful. May you be glorified in these healings that you will send. May Jesus be glorified in these healings and miracles. Pour out now your holy anointing on your people. Give some the gift of prophecy and miracles and all of those things too, but we also ask for faith and hope and love, the greatest. Much more love, much more faith. Protect us in the coming weeks and years. Help us trust you at all times, no matter how hard and difficult it gets. We love you. Please help us love you more. Help us be obedient more, be righteous more, like James says. The, the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Thank you for all you have done. Thank you for all the healings and all the answered prayers you have given. May, may there be many, many, many more. In Jesus, Yeshua's mighty name, thank you for everything. Amen.